Let's <clears throat> let's go to um, to our esteemed honorable Paul Hellyer of uh, Canada. We would uh, give you 20 minutes, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak. And uh, thank you, Steve, for the invitation. My name, as I said, was Paul Hellyer. I'm a former Minister of National Defence for Canada. I served in three governments during a total of 23 and a half years as a member of Parliament. Although as Minister of National Defence, um, I had sighting reports uh, of UFOs. Uh, I was too busy to be concerned about them at the time because I was trying to unify the Army, Navy and Air Force into a single Canadian Defence Force. And that itself was a kind of uh, battle to the finish. So um, this was not high on my agenda. But it, about 10 years ago, I started getting interested uh, due to a young man from Ottawa sending me material on the subject. I told him I was too busy to read it, but he had confidence that someday I would. He sent me a copy of um, Colonel Corso's book, The Day After Roswell. It took me a while to get around to reading it, but I took it uh, for my summer reading in 2005 and um, was really impressed with what was contained in it. And what I thought to myself is there are huge issues here, huge issues. And the American people and the people of the world have a right to know what's going on because they're part of it. It's not just an isolated thing. And so after confirming the contents of the book with a retired uh, United States Air Force general, I accept the invitation of Victor Vigiani, uh, who is over here somewhere, and his uh, cohort, uh, Mike Bird, to speak to a symposium at the University of Toronto. And uh, I said, UFOs are as real as the airplanes flying overhead. That gave me the dubious distinction of being the first person of cabinet rank in the G8 group of company, countries uh, to say so unequivocally. <laughs> Since then, I've learned a lot from many sources, including a number of the fantastic witnesses that we have heard these last four days. They were so outstanding, I was just really blown away with them, uh, the amount of information that was available. And I appreciate uh, every single one of them. But because I'm not a ufologist, um, I'm a politician, there are only a few things that I want to add in that particular realm. <clears throat> First is that about um, in the 1960s sometime, there was a flotilla of UFOs headed south that crossed into NATO territory in Europe. And um, the commander-in-chief of uh, the Supreme Allied, Allied uh, Headquarters in Europe, uh, was naturally very shaken. Uh, fortunately, or maybe divine providence, before um, the panic button was pushed, the flotilla turned around and headed back north. Uh, obviously, they had thought maybe they were Russian and they were very concerned about it. Anyway, uh, an investigation was launched into this whole subject, and uh, a document was prepared which uh, concluded that at least four species had been visiting Earth for thousands of years. And this is my own uh, view at this stage as well. So, except for that, there are just a couple of um, things that we've talked about that I'd like to refer to. And one uh, was that we've we're referring to them as they until this morning when Linda Moulton Howe, I think she was the first one, actually named three different species. I have brought my uh, latest book uh, called Light at the End of the Tunnel, a survival plan for the human species as an aid memoir. And uh, I name five different uh, species here. I'm aware of uh, more now. As a matter of fact, I saw a document uh, just a few days ago that mentioned 20. Uh, 
And I think you, Mr. Chairman, were interested in some of the places they might come from. And I have in here Zeta Reticuli, R -E -T -I -C -U -L -I, Reticuli, the Pleiades, Orion, and Romita, and the Altair star systems. So uh, I don't think we can any more refer them to them as they because they're not an amorphous mass. They are different species and consequently may have different agendas. I don't think we can say that they all have the ag same agenda any more than we could say that the United States, uh, China, and, uh, and Russia had the same ag agenda. Our real interests may be very similar, uh, but as of now, our perceived interests are still uh, quite <coughs> far apart. One more observation before I begin what I want to say, and that is that we spent quite a bit of time talking about the 66-year-old cadavers, and I was glad to have Linda this morning finally say that there are live ETs on Earth at this present time, and um, at least two of them probably working with the United States government. I, the seventh, the other species that I learned about uh, not too long ago was called the Tall Whites. And uh, this is when Paula Harris uh, broke the story just a few years ago. And through her good offices, I had the chance to talk for about three hours with former airman Charles Hall and uh, listen to this absolutely fascinating story of uh, how he was working with, first of all, he was scared out of his skin. But after that, when he got to know them, how he was working with, and finally, they became to trust each other and have a good working relationship with the tall whites at the uh, gunnery range at Indian Springs in Nevada. And these tall whites were living on United States Air Force property and working in cooperation with the United States Air Force and sharing technology uh, with them. He wrote a book, incidentally, called Millennial Hospitality. There are four different versions, but uh, Paula says that uh, Millennial Hospitality uh, number two is the best. I think that's the one I read, and it's a, it's a very interesting read uh, if you want to sort of get inside the, the problem of what it's like to bump into these people floating across the, uh, the terrain in the, in the desert. <coughs> well, enough on that for now. My interest is in full disclosure. And uh, I just, my only caveat is I think probably I would say 95 to 98 percent full disclosure. I know of one or two things that I'm not sure should be in the public domain, at least yet. They will be someday, I'm sure, but not maybe immediately. But just as children survive uh, the idea of the uh, tooth fairy and Santa Claus when they become adult, I think that taxpaying citizens are quite capable of accepting the new and broader reality that we live in a cosmos teeming with life of various sorts. The fact that some other civilizations are more advanced than we are may be humbling, but that could be a necessary step in our survival. The world is an unholy mess. We have it best until the end of this decade. In my book, I said we have 10 years to stop global warming if we don't want it to be beyond the point of no return. Two years has gone past since it was written, so I say we have until the end of the decade to arrest global warming. Yet our leaders don't even talk about it very much except in a superficial way. They appear to be more interested in starting wars to control more oil and in effect prolong the gravity of the threat. Of course, even if they took the problem seriously, they wouldn't have the finances to finance the transition from oil to the clean economy, to clean energy, because we have an infinitely silly banking and financial system in the Western world. <laughs> and the United States Congress, I regret to say, is partly responsible, and I'd be glad to uh, elaborate on that later if you're interested. And finally, they need the technology for clean energy. 
and it exists and is being kept secret by the same vested interests who control our destiny. Who are these vested interests and what are they up to? Well, Senator, you were talking about a military junta. In my opinion, that is true, but I have broadened and deepened the definition uh, to cabal, and the cabal comprises members of the three sisters, the Council on Foreign Relations, the Bilderbergers, and the Trilateral Commission, the International Banking Cartel, the Oil Cartel, members of various intelligence organizations, and select members of the military unit, who together have become a shadow government of not only the United States, but of much of the Western world. The Council on Foreign Relations is the oldest of the three sisters, and uh, As early as October 1940, years before Germany surrendered to the Allied armies and to vaporize Hitler's vision of empire, the Council's economic and financial group drafted a memorandum outlining a comprehensive policy, quote, to set forth the political, military, territorial, and economic requirements of the United States in its political potential leadership of the non-German world including the United Kingdom itself, as well as the Western Hem Hemisphere and the Far East. The Council made absolutely no effort to disguise... Uh, where is that? Right next to... Uh, yeah. The Council made no effort to disguise the fact that the purpose of the Grand Area and later world hegemony was to support an expanding U.S. economy to provide it with raw materials and markets for its products. This was labeled the national interest, quote unquote. It was equally clear that the national interest was the interest of the ruling elite whose members comprised the council. The real interests of the majority of rank and file Americans was never a factor in the, equa in the equation. So, um, Mr. David Rockefeller, who is a member of all three of the sisters, is quoted as saying this at a meeting of the Bilderbergers in Europe. We are grateful to the Washington Post, the New York Times, Time Magazine, and other great publications whose directors have attended our meetings and respected their promises of discretion for almost 40 years. It would have been impossible for us to develop our plan for the world if we had been subjected to the lights of publicity during those years. But the world is more sophisticated and prepared to march toward a world government. The supranational sovereignty of an intellectual elite and world bankers is surely preferable to the national auto-determination practiced in past centuries. He, of course, uh, pretended he didn't say that, but the witness uh, this is reported by Daniel Estulin, a thoroughly reliable uh, uh, reporter who has written the two, true story of the Bilderberger group, and if you want to uh, to really get inside of what's been going on there for this uh, long time, uh, that's a good place to go. So anyway, you hear what Mr. Rockefeller said, and so there you have it. The aim of the game is a world government comprising members of the cabal who are elected by no one and accountable to no one. And according to Mr. Rockefeller, the plan is well advanced. Does this help you to understand why our civil rights are being taken away from us? I say us, because Canada too is included in the grand plan. 
A giant leap in the wrong direction followed the end of the Cold War. <clears throat> no one could have been happier than I was when the Berlin Wall came down on November the 9th, 1989. The elation on our side of the curtain was near universal and very significant on the other side as one country after another regained its freedom. Nearly everyone believed that it was the dawn of a new era of peace and prosperity for people everywhere. There was much talk of a peace dividend. The prospects were dazzling, dazzling in their scope and diversity. It was a unique and God-given opportunity for a new, braver, and fairer world. We blew it. We blew the chance of a lifetime to do good things. A small group of zealots undermined our golden opportunity to, per to pursue peace, not war, and little did we dream that they had a vastly different vision of the new world order. Their plan, which is now commonly known as the Project for a New American Century, included preventive wars and clear violation of international law, regime change wherever and whenever the U.S. desires, and if they can get away with it without excessive casualties, and the establishment of a kind of economic and cultural hegemony with America acting as constabulary, quote unquote. That was their word globally. This was to be accomplished without authority of the United Nations and without the restraint of existing international treaties. It would involve a military buildup unprecedented in peacetime history and could trigger an arms race which is precisely the opposite of the peace dividend that the world had rightly looked forward to. The Machiavellian scheme involved secret police the curtailment of civil liberties and defiance of the U.S. Constitution, and a moribund economy operating way below its potential. Exactly those features for which the Soviet Union was held in contempt. The initial draft of the do document was so controversial when it was leaked to the New York Times that it had to be rewritten, but um, it was not uh, changed very much, just the cosmetics enough to make it uh, politically acceptable. So uh, minute here to my bearings. The uh, document said this. Well, it may have been easy to persuade President Bush to abandon his stated policy of not getting America more deeply involved in international affairs, but persuading the American people would be more difficult. Sophisticated Americans would question such a giant sea change in policy. The authors of Rebuilding America's Defenses, Strategy, Forces, and Resources for a New Century recognized this difficulty from the outset because their document contained the following sentence. Further, I'm quoting, further the process of transformation, even if it brings revolutionary changes, is likely to be a long one, absent some catastrophic and catalyzing event like a new Pearl Harbor. Well, it wasn't too long before they got their catastrophic and catalyzing event. Terrorists struck the World Trade Center in New York and the Pentagon in Washington on September the 11th, 2011. Incidentally, they have removed the sentence about Pearl Harbor in the document that you can now get if you uh, went to the Internet to find it. Almost the whole world mourned. Canada mourned. The overwhelming majority of Muslims condemned the treacherous attacks. 
My sympathy for the friends and families of the injured and dead was genuine and unwavering to this day. My sympathy for the U.S. government began to grow a bit thin, however, when I heard President Bush cite the reasons for the attack. I quote, why do they hate us? He asked rhetorically in an address to the Congress. They hate what they see right here in this chamber, democratically elected government. Their leaders are self-appointed. They hate our freedoms, our freedom of religion, our freedom of speech, our freedom to vote and assemble and disagree with each other. I felt sad when I heard the President's word. I assumed that he believed what he was saying. But if that were true, he was profoundly ignorant of the real thoughts and feelings of people in other parts of the world. If he wanted to hear the truth, he should have listened to Osama bin Laden, who was well informed concerning the origins of the kind of fanatical hatred of the United States, which has led to such treachery. This is his version of events. Every Muslim must rise to defend his religion. The wind of faith is blowing and the wind of change is blowing to remove evil from the peninsula of Muhammad. Peace be upon him. As to America, I say to you and its people a few words. I swear to God that America will not live in peace before peace reigns in Palestine and before all the army of infidels depart the land of Muhammad. Peace be upon him. That is clear enough. The dislike of America has nothing to do with democracy versus dictatorship or wealth or freedom of religion or freedom of assembly. It is directed re directly related to American foot dragging and stick handling a just settlement of the Palestinian question. Uh, Mr. Heller, <coughs> Heller I'd, uh hate to interrupt, uh, time has expired, but I'm very happy if the panel has no objection uh, to allow another a minute or two to finish your statement. How much time do you think you need I'd, to finish it? I think probably somewhere between one and five minutes, most. I think we'll give you two minutes to finish your statement, as much as I'd like to grant more. Thank you. Okay. In short, American falls foreign policy was the root of the conflict. So here we are more than a decade later fighting another war that can't be won. There is no country on earth powerful enough to protect its citizens against fanatical hate, as we learn from the Boston Marathon. And the mere attempt to pursue the impossible pits neighbor against neighbor and the state power structure against everyone. All of the freedoms won by the millions of men and women who fought and died in World War II are being flushed in unceremoniously down the drain. The only hope of peace is a negotiated settlement. This will require a paradigm shift in American attitudes. It involves a de, de facto renunciation of the plan for a new American energy and the adoption of a pledge of cooperation with all humankind to build the kind of world which we are collectively capable of. Young people everywhere need to be challenged by a noble cause. They need to be involved in arresting global warming, creating a banking system that is just and sustainable, and lead the way in the transformation to the new reality that we have to live in harmony with our celestial neighbors as well as seeking peace on earth. In a word, in a word, we have to become spiritual beings and practice the one tenet that the world's major religions have in common, and that is the golden rule. In this field, too, and I just want to read one paragraph in this, at this time, if you'll allow me, Mr. Chair. Well, we will allow that, but there's only about 30 seconds, so I hope you can conclude well, it with I'll, that I'll read statement. Fast. Thank you. This is from uh, the late Dr. John Mack, an American secular Jewish psychiatrist who became a world leader in interviewing abductees, or experiencers, as he called them, came to this conclusion in a startling book, Passport to the Cosmos. Quote, although the aliens are not themselves gods, their behavior is sometimes anything but godlike. Abductees consistently report that the beings seem closer to the Godhead than we are, acting as messengers, guardian spirits, or angels, intermediaries between us and the divine source. Thank you.
Thank you very much.